My name is Mitch Ferguson. I'm Application Engineering Manager for Renesis. Our applications group, or a large portion of it, is actually out in Durham, North Carolina. So that's where I'm stationed. And the title of this is ADC Resolution, Myth and Reality. Now we're actually going to talk a little bit more about things other than just ADC resolution. But the reason this presentation kind of came around was, as usual, because of marketing. And they came up and they said, hey, we got a 24-bit ADC. I said, yeah. So, you know, we need this guy and he's doing, he's doing a, a measuring, he's doing a scale, he needs 19 bits. I said, it's not going to work. He said, we got 24. I said, yeah, it's really only 14. He said, wait a second, is, is it 24-bit? I said, well, you're going to get 24 bits out, but only 14 of them are any good. There's no doubt. You've, if you've been reading the MCU data sheets to find out how an A to D works, there's a lot of myth and reality that we need to discuss. And that's what I'm going to kind of go about. What is resolution? How do these specs really affect what you're trying to do? What things in your system are going to prevent you from reaching the spec, even if it is properly specified? And so like I said, I'm actually an analog engineer, spent probably 15, 20 years. A lot of what I did was A to D either external or then bringing them into MCUs using slope converters, um, all sorts of different techniques. Uh, it's kind of my background. So you can see my uh, bio. Basically, the biggest thing is that you see a lot of the stuff up there like EMI, EMS, analog, actually hardware engineer doing things like fire control. I've done some automotive stuff. So I've been into both industrial type environments, noise environments. Um, pretty used to that. And so A to D's, especially in those environments, become ex extremely tricky. Uh, you've all probably seen this slide at least once so far, hopefully, otherwise you've been at the pool. So basically the part we're going to be looking at today is our microcontroller line. We're not going to be talking about the system LSIs and the analog and power. As far as the lineup, uh, really except for the secure MCU, pretty much this is analog fundamentals. It's going to cover any of these MCUs. So it's not specific to RL78, to RX, or the RH850. So the theme of DevCon being a smart society, I look at it and say the smart society, what we're trying to do now is collect and send more information about what's going on in the world than ever was done before. And everybody knows that we got an analog world, but our communication schemes are all digital. So we're always going through this conversion from analog to digital back to analog. And in some cases, we're, we're concerned with being extremely precise with our measurements. In other cases, we're just worried about something like getting a video signal, which really can deal with a little bit of data dropout because it fills. Your eye fills. Audio is very forgiving. So the specifications change, but in all cases, it's coming down in a lot of cases to doing analog to digital, sending it someplace else, and converting it back. So the agenda, we're going to talk about what does resolution spec really mean. We're going to look at the DC accuracy specs. I will go through them quickly, but make sure we're all on the same page as far as gain, DNL, and INL. Um, talk a little bit about how an ADC is tested. And this is important from the standpoint of once you understand the problems with testing it, you understand why some of the specifications are a little gray. Uh, what those errors don't tell you, you know, what's kind of hidden behind the scenes. We'll look at AC specifications, which is things you may not have dealt with if you're doing mostly SARs in an MCU. So we'll look at signal to noise ratio. We'll look at the effective number of bits. We'll look at signal to noise and distortion. And then finally, I'm going to talk about system errors and resolution requirements. So go through and say, OK, we want to measure a value. How do we actually choose the A to D? How many bits do I really need to be able to hit that spec? And that'll include you know, reference errors and some things like source impedance errors, which have nothing to do really with the A to D, but from the system standpoint, they can make everything just fall apart. Okay. So to start with, you got an A to D. What is the term when you look at it and somebody says, oh, I have a 10-bit A to D. That's its resolution, right? What does that mean to you? What does the term resolution on an A to D mean to you? We got a... Definition? Yeah. The raw number of bits I'm going to get back. Okay, so if, if I get 10 bits back in the word, it's 10 bit A to D. Right. 
So to the 10 minus 1, that is the resolution being that is the granularity that I have. And all these things are true. But the second part of it is, what does it mean as far as actually being able to use that in a system? Does that 10 pits always mean I get one part in 1,024? Does it always mean I get 0.1% accuracy? What are the little things, what are the little caveats? Why is it that I say that if you got a 24-bit delta sigma, the odds are you can't get 24 bits of usable data out of it. You're going to get 24 bits back. That's its resolution. But then I'm going to tell you it's a 16-bit A to D. So obviously there's something wrong here with the, the 2 to the N. Because the first thing I'm going to do is tell you throw out E to the bits. So that's one of the things that we're really going to talk about. And unfortunately, uh, it's not as clear cut even as that. So we start out looking at probably the most common uh, approximation, the successive approximation, most common A to D in MCUs at least, right? And so the operation is pretty straightforward. Typically we have an input analog MUX, select multiple channels. That goes into a sample and hold, which is just about in every A to D now. It used to be you could get them either way, not now. The sample and hold stays, samples the input for a little bit of time, then isolates it. And then basically we compare that isolated voltage using a comparator to the output of a DAC. And we just, first of all, we set the most significant bit into the DAC. We see which one's higher, go through the sequence, right? This is kind of the standard block that everybody sees, right? It's the one we do. It's pretty quick because you only have to sit there and spin through those bits. Has pretty good accuracy. And in this case, what is going to set the resolution? Basically the size of the ladder or the size of the register driving a ladder. So if I have a 10-bit DAC, I'm going to have a 10-bit A to D because that's how I'm doing the conversion. So it's very straightforward. And because of an SAR, the way it works, the 2 to the N is fairly straightforward because usually you're going to get out that many bits with LSB, you know, one LSB, maybe two LSB error at the most. You know, it's usually pretty good. One thing to notice is the DC specs, all the things that you always look like, the one LSB of INL, that really, that definition is only about the part in blue. It does not take into the count the sample and hold circuit, the analog MUX, or anything else. When they measure it, the DC specs are really telling you about the linearity of that part of the circuit. So just kind of keep that in mind as we go through. Now I want to look at another type, which kind of starts bringing out the resolution issue. Simple slope converter. And in this case, basically, I want to measure this thermistor or whatever that sensor is, which is represented by R. I have a reference capacitor on the bottom. Right? And the basic operation is when I'm stopped, the GPIO output is low, which means the capacitor is discharged. Right? I don't have the timer running. The timer is zeroed out at this point. So in this case, with a low in, I'm going to have basically the capacitor is at zero, VREF is at plus. The output of the comparator is going to be high. I've started the operation by removing the GPIO signal, shorting out the cap, and the capacitor starts to charge. What's going to happen next? The, start, the timer started, right? So now I have a timer running, and I have a capacitor charging. And at some point, the capacitor is going to have enough charge on it that the output of the comparator is going to go low. That goes into the timer and stops the timer instantaneously. So now I have a value in the timer that is equivalent to the RC time constant or the RC charge on that circuit. Right? I can read the timer out and basically do an equation. I know what C is. Use a lot of math. I can figure out what R is. Very straightforward. Actually can be extremely accurate. And it is the basis of the dual slope. There's some modifications for dual slope to make it a little more accurate, but that's basically what they're doing. What will set the maximum resolution of this circuit? How many bits got a timer? If it's a 16-bit timer, obviously the most I'm going to get is 16 bits. Realistically, if you've ever designed one of these things, it's almost impossible to get that whole timer width. Because that would mean I'd have to have that, that RC time constant match up perfectly with the timing clock so that it overflowed just at the right second. So in reality, I'll get 16 bits out, but probably I'm only going to be able to use maybe 12 of them because I need margin just to make sure I don't overflow. It's just the logistics of trying to design the circuit. But 
If it had a 16-bit timer, I would call it a 16-bit A to D because that's the word I'm getting back. Now I might say I have 16-bit A to D, only 12 of them are really being useful for me because I'm not using the top 20%, but it's a 16-bit A to D. Questions, comments on that? This is still pretty, pretty straightforward. You know, then they came around and they went with the delta sigma. And this is where things really started to get a little crazy because the true resolution of a delta sigma is one bit. I mean, that's what we're going to look at. So a simple operation is let's just assume that it, to start with, I have four volts coming in. I started out the input on the summer at zero. So basically, out of the um, summing amplifier, I'm going to have some positive voltage, depending on the gain. That positive voltage is going to start to ramp the integrator up. Right? So I'm going to have an integration, so that's a ramping function. At some point, that slope is going to get large enough to be higher than VREF on the comparator, and the output of the reference is going to go high. Clock comes in, clocks it to the output. You notice now I feed back the 5 volts, and what's going to happen? Everything's going to go the opposite direction, right? Output's going to go low, the integrator's going to ramp down. And what I end up with is I end up with a bit stream that is proportional to the input voltage. Right? So basically it's a one bit A to D. I'm getting zeros and ones and how wide the stream of a zero is or how wide the stream of a one is is all proportional to the input voltage. Now, like with PWM, if I give you a PWM stream, you could tell me what the DC average voltage is, right? just by going through and running it through a low pass filter. Basically the DC average of that bit stream is proportional to the input voltage. So all I have to do is take that bit stream and run it through a low pass filter and the number that comes flying out is equal to the input voltage. And this is what you usually see, it's a digital filter actually, they call it a decimation filter. It's actually going to do a low pass filtering function, it's going to take this extremely high clocking rate down to some reasonable clocking rate. And that's really how a delta sigma works. So what's the resolution? It's obviously not set by any of these physical parameters anymore. Right? And that's where this all starts to become a little more crazy. So when you look at it, for example, for, uh, on the RX21A, which has a 24-bit delta sigma in it, um, one of the specs you'll get is the oversampling frequency. This is the frequency of the clock oops, that is going into that D flip-flop. So this is how fast I'm churning bits through this thing. So for example, on the RX21A, that's 3.125 megahertz. I'm sitting there doing conversions on a single bit at a 3 megahertz rate. But the second number that's more important is that you have a minimum conversion rate, or the fastest time that you can get a full word out. So in this case, even though I'm sampling at 3.125 megahertz at the bit rate, basically my output only shows up every 81.92 microseconds, right? which you can see is a much lower frequency. Right? So which number really matters to you? Only the sample rate. Right? You really can't do anything about the 3.125 megahertz. The only thing that counts is the sampling rate. Now one of the drawbacks typically to delta sigmas is, let's say we're in sleep mode and I wake up and I try to take an A to D sample. How long before I get my result? Eighty-one point nine microseconds. So the biggest drawback is delta sigmas work best in continuous data streams. This is why they were typically used for things like audio. You're just running data through it all the time. Now, with something like a microcontroller, a lot of times what you do is you wake up, you take one sample of a temperature sensor, and you go do something else. It really is not the best use, because these have tremendous delays in loading up the information. So they are not fast. You know, you can get a two microsecond conversion on a SAR. You're not going to get two microsecond conversion times on delta sigmas. But if you're sitting there running continuous data like energy calculations through them, who cares? Once you filled it up, it keeps coming out. But there is a definite delay to get data out. Now the other thing is, if I don't take as many bits out, 
So this ratio gives me 24 bits. If I don't take as many bits out, I can actually go 18 bits and then I can convert faster. So all of a sudden, instead of it being fixed, I have 24 bits at a 12.2 kilohertz rate, or I can do 18 bits at a 20 kilohertz rate. And it's all just a trade-off. You want more bits, or you want faster conversion? Because really, the bit rate is much higher at one bit, and then it's just how much am I going to bring it down? The longer I take, the more of those numbers I can churn through my little low-pass filter, the better the number I'm going to get. But I have more delay. So resolution now actually becomes a variable based on how fast you want to update. And that is a huge difference from whatever you ever had in an SAR. It was pretty much always, OK, it's fixed, two microseconds. I want to talk about oversampling. One of the most important things about all of A to D's is oversampling. So if I look at this, one of the problems everybody's kind of aware of is quantization, right? I mean, we have, that's why resolution is important, is if I only have 10 bits, each bit has a quantization area that I can't distinguish any lower than. So in this case, I'm showing a very small A to D, and basically on the left-hand side, you see the bits that I can get out are 0, 1, 2, and 3. And each one of those corresponds to an ADC transition voltage. Right? So this is just standard A to D theory. Right? So in this case, I have a DC voltage which is shown with the red line. I take four samples. Each one of them is going to give me the exact same result. Right? They haven't crossed over the transition levels. So if each one of those samples is added up, I get in a result of four. Right? If I took four samples, S1, S2, S3, S4, each one came back at one. I added them all up, I get four. Everybody agree? Okay. Now, if I get this second A to D ADC voltage comes in, which has not gone across any thresholds, what am I going to get back? Four, right? That's quantization error because those are not the same DC voltage, but it ends up being the same result. So I oversampled. How many bits did I get? How much change did I get out of taking those four samples? Nothing. I didn't gain anything. So what's the problem? Your system's too quiet. Throw some noise in it. So actually, noise in A to D's is great. You want noise. Because if you don't have noise, you can't oversample. Because basically, I'm getting the same result out over and over again. And without any noise, there's no value in oversampling. Let's look at the same thing, but now I throw some noise over that DC signal. So the green is a noise signal riding on the DC. You notice now, sample one actually ends up being up in the two bin. Sample two is in the one bin. Sample three is in the two bin. Now when I add my four samples up, I get six. When the DC drops to the lower level, I take those four same samples, my result is four. So now what has happened is I actually have added resolution to my A to D with two levels that previously were within bins, I am now being, I can now distinguish, which means I effectively have more bits of resolution. So with a 10-bit A to D, if I oversample, I can make it an 11-bit A to D. If I oversample some more, I can make it 12. I can make it 15. Because the reality is that 10 bits didn't really mean anything. It was just how big your answer was. If I have noise in the system and I oversample, I can increase the resolution of the A to D. If you oversample two times, you take two samples of the same signal, and you assume that there's noise in the system, which is always going to be in an MCU, so it's really not a problem. Oversampling by two times increases the resolution by a half a bit. So if I, if I oversampled four times, you think you'd get a full bit, right? Doesn't work. <laughs> to increase the resolution by n bits, it's this relationship. You have to oversample 4 to the n and decimate 2 to the n. So basically, if I want to add 2 bits of resolution, I want to go from 10 bits to 12 bits, I have to oversample 16 times and then divide by 4. That will add 2 bits. Now you start to see, though, what's the problem with just trying to oversample and get more resolution? Let's say I want to go from a 10-bit A to D to 13-bit A to D. I now have to oversample 64 times and then decimate down. 
very quickly the amount of samples becomes unrealistic. Right? Unless you do something like a delta sigma where there's some other things involved with noise shaping, et cetera. So to add a bit or two by doing oversampling is reasonable. To think that you're going to take a 10-bit SAR and change it into a 14-bit, yeah, if that's all the MCU is doing, it might be practical. But in reality, this is usually only good for a couple of bits. But it is the theory behind delta sigmas and everything else, that you can increase the resolution by oversampling. Yes? Yeah. So. Right, so the one thing is, and I was, you know, kind of going to bring that up later, is the assumption here is that the noise is non-coherent. Non-coherent meaning it is not related to the, the sampling rate or the ADC sample. So if the noise you're getting in is a clock signal that is in the A to D block, that's not helping. It has to have a Gaussian distribution so that the, the noise basically sums back to zero. If, you know, so if you fed a square wave in along with your sine wave that was at the clock frequency, yeah, it's not going away. It's just going to put noise on it. But most of the noise that you actually end up with in the A to D, or one of the big sources of it, is a lot of front end noise uh, associated with switching the sample and holds and stuff. And that does end up being Gaussian. So most of the time, this will work out for you with no problem. But if you do have coherent noise, you're letting clock signals get down into your A to D, that noise is not going to go away. Because basically it does not filter itself out. Any questions or comments on this? Okay. So it is a useful theorem. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about ADC accuracy. Basically this is the ideal curve for an A to D. Zero volts in, you should have zero counts. When you put in full scale voltage, you should end up with full scale counts. Straight line in between. Pretty straightforward. Almost no A to D looks like that. They typically will look something like this. I mean, all variations are possible. But in this case, you see with zero volts in, I don't get zero, or I get zero counts, but I don't get any increasing counts until I get out a little bit. I actually have to start bumping the voltage up to get something to happen. Then rather than being a straight line, it's kind of like a spline curve. It's a little less. And then I actually hit full scale before I ever get full scale voltage in. That's a real curve. That's what you typically would end up with. The bottom error, the fact that zero doesn't equal zero is referred to offset error. The top error, which is uh, not full scale, is either called full scale error or gain error. They are very slightly different, but basically full scale. One nice thing about these, they can be calibrated out. Right? So I can go in there and I can calibrate out the, the zero and I can calibrate out the full scale error. The next step once you've done that, the, the way the specs are written is you calibrate those two out or compensate for them, then you draw a straight line between where you cross zero and where you hit full scale. That becomes your reference line. Then the nonlinearity error, the integral nonlinearity, which is the one I'm showing here, is the difference between that adjusted curve and the real curve. All right? So that's what you're getting for INL, basically is the difference between an adjusted curve, you've had to do calibration, and the real curve. In a lot of cases, you're going to get a second spec. The second spec will either be called absolute error or maybe total unadjusted error. That is the difference between the real curve and the ideal curve. No compensation. So that's a different number. So you might have a one-bit INL and a three-bit total unadjusted error. So if I don't want to have the manufacturing group do any calibrations, which one do I have to design with? Absolute error, or total unadjusted. If I'm willing to do a calibration step, I can take it down to INL. And I get the question all the time, can you calibrate out INL? No. It basically is impractical. Um, because INL, first of all, to do it, to really compensate for it, you would have to do a for a 10-bit A to D, you'd have to take 1,024 calibration points, and then they are not guaranteed to be the same across process. So every MCU would have to get a full resolution lookup table. So in reality, the INL, you can never do better than it. Any questions on the DC specs? Most of these should be familiar to you because this is usually what you're going to see in an MCU. That's the only numbers you're going to get, typically, is the, uh, the DC specs which do not include the sample and hold errors, 
They don't include any AC noise errors. They don't include things like hysteresis on the comparator. They put the way you test it, you know, you basically put in a straight DC, you hold it there, never change anything, and then run many, many samples to see what the number is coming out. So the sample and hold isn't necessary. The comparator has no hysteresis because it's not changing. Nothing's going on. And then basically you just run like a thousand samples and say, okay, well, what is that code? Okay, there it is. How far is that off ideal? Right? Now one thing is, if I'm taking a thousand samples to get this number, what's that tell you about if I snap one sample? It may not hit that. There's no guarantee. Right? One bit INL is if you were to take 10, 15 samples, it will always be within one bit. You take one sample, I don't know. Because that's called noise. <laughs> so this is one of the things is the INL actually is a statistical average. A single sample does not have to hit that because that is now AC noise. Definition of noise is something that doesn't happen repeatedly. So typically, that's why I, I would usually take at least four samples on something I want to make sure of because I can take any one reading and that reading could be skewed by noise hitting at the same time I do my A to D. Is that a flaw in the spec? No. Because the spec is telling you what the nonlinear area inside the chip is. But from a system level, can you guarantee me that there's never any noise that hits the A to D pin? And you take one sample and that noise hits the A to D, what happens? Your reading is off. And that really is not the fault of INL. So you should over, always oversample just because of noise. AC testing method, you put a sine wave into the A to D and basically you perform an FFT. And then you measure the signal to noise ratio, the signal to noise plus distortion, and also something called spurious free dynamic range. You also measure a couple other things, but these are the three key ones. Um, signal noise and signal noise distortion are the ratio of the RMS values of the noise to the fundamental. The only difference between SNR and SNDR is SNDR con uh, contains the harmonics where SNR takes it out. So one is including distortion, one is not including distortion, it is all no other noises. So if I tell you something like you have 80 dB signal and noise in any type of format, what does that tell you? What does that mean if I say I have an 80 dB signal to noise ratio? 80 dB. Well, let's do an easy 20 dB because that's a little easier. Yeah, basically what it is, it's a gain spec, right? Signal to noise is a gain spec or saying how much bigger is my signal than the noise floor? I always have a noise floor. So in this case, this is actually a signal to noise and you can see the, the main lobe there. That's my signal. Now you see down, you see all that scatter. That's noise, right? So basically if I'm telling you that I have a signal to noise of 86 dB, 20 dB is a factor of 10. Right? So that actually is a factor of 40 or 10 to the fourth plus 2. So it's just telling you how much bigger is your signal than your noise. Why would that be important? It affects the LS bits because if I have, let's say I have a signal and I have a 20 dB signal to noise ratio. That means the noise is 10 times bigger, or the, the signal is 10 times bigger than the noise, right? How much resolution can I get at? I, I can't get anything but a factor of 10 resolution change, right? Because pretty soon the noise is just going to become part of my signal. If I split it into 1,000 pieces and I only have a 10 dB or 20 dB change, I can't distinguish the signal from the noise. Where would that be important? If you're doing a thermometer, it's all steady state, right? What about audio, right? That's because the signal and noise is telling me how much hiss I have in the background. What if you're doing motor control and you're trying to read currents? Well, if the noise that you got in the A to D is the same as the current you got in the A to D, which one are you adjusting on, the noise or the current? So it is an important spec, but for most people, it's not an intuitive spec. So when I tell you you have an 86 dB signal to noise ratio, how many bits is that? Use this formula. <laughs> it's the easy way. 
There is a relationship that tells you, if you know the dB signal noise ratio, what the, the equivalent perfect A to D would be. So the effective number in bits is given by the signal and noise distortion ratio minus 1.76 over 6.02. Right? The 6.02 is uh, converts decibels log base 10 to log base 2 because that's what you want. The 1.76 comes from the ideal quantization error of an A to D. So 86 dB would then have the equivalent resolution of a perfect 14-bit A to D. Basically what it's telling me. It is done at a frequency. Now, you have to be a little tricky about this. See this, which is actual spec. See those two red lines? They specified it within that range. If it's specified perfectly, it would be specified up to the Nyquist frequency. Because if it's done at the Nyquist, it's going to get worse as frequency goes higher. So if it's done at the Nyquist, that's your highest frequency that you convert. It will be your worst case noise signal. Most people also do it with a full scale input. Because if I don't have a full scale input, my noise is a higher, signif more significant value. So you see here that if I have times one gain coming in, I have 86 dB. Well, if I go to a times four gain, the dB drops off to 81. Why did it drop off to 81? Less signal, I actually gained my signal up. While I was gaining the signal up, what else did I gain up? The noise. I can't say, oh, just don't amplify the noise. I just want to amplify the signal. So it's also typically done with maximum input seal signal rail to rail. If they don't use rail to rail on the signal, they're going to get a worse number. So if you can't use the rail to rail signal, you're not going to get that same resolution. But that's actually true even with a regular A to D. If the VREF is 3 volts and you don't use 3 volts, if you can't get all the way to 3 volts, you can't get the whole resolution. But unlike a DC spec here, notice that over 1.71 kilohertz, that's all we ranged it to. Look how bad the signal to noise ratio is down under 17 hertz. Right? You see it collapses totally. But the application of this is metering for 60 hertz signal, which means under 17 hertz is automatically filtered. So it really is not important to the, to the user, unless you're using it for something other than the metering, which is our intention. Any questions on that? This is a spec you're going to see more and more. You're going to see, because you're seeing delta sigmas come into your A to Ds, this is the spec you're going to get. You probably are not going to get an INL spec. Right? AC testing, the only problem with it, doesn't tell you anything about the linearity. So it's a 14-bit it's a, a to D. Only problem is I have, no, I have no idea how many bits of INL it has. And there is no way I can calculate that. I actually need two different specs. If you're doing DC, you need a DC spec. If you're doing AC, you need an AC spec. You cannot convert the two. DNL and INL do affect the SNDR, so they will affect your reading. But you can't say, oh, well, if it's 86 dB, that means I have three LSBs of error. It, do, it doesn't correlate. So really, it's one of those things that what you're getting now is this spec or this spec, but really, you should always have both. In reality, the MCU manufacturers don't do that, and, and not only Renesis. Almost no MCU manufacturer I know of actually gives you both of those specs all the time. Oversampling is still valid and reduces the average noise if the Gaussian distribution, distribution exists. So I can still go in with AC and, and do uh, oversampling because as I oversample, that noise floor will keep reducing, just the way noise goes. Any questions on that? So this is kind of the myth. The myth is that the specs that you've probably been reading all the way along with INL and DNL, that they really told you the full story. They were kind of ignoring something. Or if you were doing delta sigmas and you were getting AC specs, that that really then told you anything about the accuracy. I will tell you that typically with delta sigmas, their, their INL and DNL are so low because it's a one bit DAC that in most cases you'll be able to actually get the AC spec out of it. I mean, that would be typical because it's just, you don't have many nonlinearities in a one bit DAC system. It's just kind of hard to do. Okay, I want to do a quick example. What I want to do is take, and I want to measure 0 to 2 volts DC. 
and I need plus or minus one quarter percent of full scale accuracy, which would be five millivolts. Everybody agree, right? Two volts, quarter percent, five millivolts. VREF is now three volts. Okay? So we want to look at what ADC range and resolution do I need? So the LSB must be less than 10 millivolts. I mean, if I want my error to be less than plus or minus five, I can't have an LSB be bigger than my ADC range, right? It just got to happen. So now if I look at that, I say a quarter percent of two volts is 10 millivolts. If I got to be have 10 millivolt resolution out of three volts, that means I'm looking for one part in 300. And if all I need is one part in 300, a nine bit A to D should work, right? Because nine bits A to D will give me one part in 512. So I should be able to use a 9-bit A to D. Let's look at what happens if instead I drop my V ref down to 2.5 volts. Now I still need 10 millivolts, but now it's out of 2.5 volts, which means it's one part in 250. Which means actually just by adjusting the V ref more to match my input signal, I actually can take one bit of resolution off the A to D requirement. So this, this works all the time. Almost every A to D allows you to drop the VREF down. Ideally, where would your VREF be in any case as a general statement? Equal to your full level input. You want to measure two volts? You should have an A to D ref, VREF of two volts. That will let you get the maximum use the maximum resolution of the A to D. So in this case, 2.5 would be a much better choice than 3 because I'm going to get I'm going to be able to use more of the resolution. The A to D resolution never changed, but the amount I can use becomes drastically different. And I just want to kind of show the fact that why this works out. Um, basically, one of the interesting things is a lot of people figure that an A to D starts at zero, and then the first transition is made, one, is made in LSB higher. It doesn't. Actually, the first transition on an A to D is made at a half a bit. Any idea why they do that? So instead of transitioning at one bit, they actually transition at half a bit, then every other transition ends up a bit later. In reality, there's one bit of error of, of quantization error, right? My quantization error is the difference between this step and this step. So if I told you that I had one bit of quantization error, or I had a half a bit, plus or minus, which one sounds better? Half a bit, plus or minus. <laughs> so Basically, it makes it look nice. You're going to find out that it doesn't help you a whole lot. But almost everybody offsets it by a half a bit. Makes some of the math easier. But a lot of it is just it's easier to say you have plus and minus half bit quantization error instead of saying you have plus one minus zero. Um, so when I look at this, basically, you know, if I put 10 millivolts in, I get out a code of one, and I, and I interpret that as 10 millivolts. Right? You can see everything works out good. And therefore, my error can be either minus 5 millivolts or plus 5 millivolts, a half a bit. Right. Now I want to get into the part. That all works good. And a lot of times you see people do this. But there's a problem now when you try to mix this with errors. Can we use a 10-bit A to D with plus or minus 2 bits of I and L to do what we just set up? Each LSB of error is 2.5 millivolts, right? Based upon 10 bit A to D is 1,000 parts, and 1 1,000th out of 2.5 volts is 2.5, right? So the error for two LSBs is 5 millivolts. Does that meet our spec? That's what we said. We had to have 5 millivolts, right? Right now, everything's looking good. So 5 millivolts out of 2 millivolts is quarter percent. The problem is your I and L does not include the quantization error. So the two bits would work if I didn't have quantization error, but the reality is I do. So in reality, that 2 bit I and L is 2 and a half once I add in quantization. Therefore, the total error is 6.25 millivolts. I can't use two bits. So when you do I and L, realize you have another half bit sitting outside that that is not rolled into it. They're spec separately. What about one bit of error? Well, in this case, the worst case ADC error is 2.5 millivolts. 
I still have 1.25 millivolts of quantization error. I'm at 0.1875 and it works. So it's just something people a lot of times go in there and I see them all the time and they're just picking the I and L and they take that number and don't realize they still are offset by a half a bit. Which means typically you end up being, having to have one bit better resolution. Most time people eat it up and you know, they take margin on it anyway so it's not a big deal. But just want to kind of put in that that's the way the spec's actually written. Usually in a little footnote. And you can see here how this actually happens. If I were to put in 1.251 volts, right, that's going to end up in the bin that's equal to 1 right here. Right? I would interpret that as 2.5. When I add my two bits of error in, I'm up into 7.5. But 7.5 down to 1.25 is less more than 5 millivolts. So this is just kind of a graphical representation showing that I have the two LSB of error plus the additional quantization error. So when is a 16-bit ADC not a 16-bit ADC? And this came out about a year ago and somebody came over and said, oh, somebody's got out a 16-bit ADC. SAR in an MCU. I said, no, they don't. Not happening. Actually, I had a conversation with one of our Japanese colleagues last night, and he said, oh, we're putting in a 16-bit ADC, SAR. I said, no, you aren't. It isn't happening. Because you can't. There's just too much noise in the things. It's just not going to happen. I don't believe anybody's going to do it. Now, they can make it 16 bits wide, but if they get 13 bits of actual good data out of it, I'll be amazed. Right? Now, that's my estimation from a lot of things. This is actually from a data sheet of a competitor. I didn't put the competitor's name up, not because I'm worried about you know, them coming at me. It's out of their data sheet. It was the fact that I don't think their practices are any worse. I'm not trying to say they're doing something wrong. This is typical of the industry. And this just has to be a, happens to be a very good example, so I'm using it. But I'm not saying it's that they're doing something or not fully disclosing. Because it's all here. All you've got to do is read it. Now, if you read the front page, the cut sheet, it says 16-bit A to D. If you stop there, hmm, the marketing guys got you, didn't they? Yeah. All right. So first thing I noticed when I looked at this, when they finally gave me the data sheet, I said, OK, first thing I see, total on a just there, 12-bit mode. Oh, wait a second, 16-bit A to D. First thing you did when you put I and L down was you told me 12-bit. All right, so that's not helping me. Plus, it's plus or minus 4, which is not great. I mean, that's, you know, that's typical. Max is plus or minus 6.8. Not great. I and L in 12-bit mode, plus or minus 1, actually all the way up to minus 2.7 to plus 1.9. Right. All of a sudden I go into 32-bit or 16-bit mode and now all I got is an effective number of bits and I have to oversample 32 times. Now they got hardware to do that for me. So I mean it's really nice. But all of a sudden I'm not just doing a 16-bit single conversion SAR and getting out an I and L number. Now I'm getting out an effective number of bits and look, it's only 14. And what's the I and L at that level? I don't know. They don't correlate, right? So what do you do? I mean, as you, what are you guys are going to do with it? It's like, OK, well, if I'm using it in this mode, I can assume it's going to be around 14. But that's an AC spec. That's not a DC spec. And otherwise, it looks like I've got to drop back to 12-bit mode. I'm missing some information. But it's typical. You're going to have to kind of interpret it. You're going to have to try to try it. And really, this isn't the part of it that bothers me so much. I can interpret this. I'm pretty good at it. So I went through and I thought, you know, I'll make sure that I didn't mess this up. I didn't um, miss something in the way they set up their A to D. So I went and I went through all their usage notes. And the last usage note says, to meet the specifications that are shown at the end of the manual, you must shut the CPU core down, not be toggling any I.O., and run the A to D at a special rate. And I said, well, you know, that's not a problem. I'll go talk to my motor control guy and tell him, hey, you know when you want to read those currents on the, on the motor? Yeah, shut the CPU core off. Don't use any PWMs. And then take your, your current measurements. I think he'll be pretty happy. It's only software. What's he care, right? <laughs> it's, not an, it's not abnormal. But how many of you actually know to get that spec that you've got to shut it off? It's not at a footnote at the bottom of the table, by the way. It's in the usage notes in the 6,000-page manual. Um, 
Are they different than anybody else? Like I said, that's why I didn't put their name up. I don't think they're that much different. You'll see that a lot in A to D's. Is it legitimate? Of course it's legitimate. I have no idea what you're doing with your port pins. You could be driving 30 milliamps out of every one of them right next to one of the A to D pins. It's very hard to me to specify that under all conditions of an MCU. It's one of the problems. On an A to D, I can do it because I usually set up special conditions. I don't figure you got a PWM coming out of the side of the, the A to D. With an MCU, this is typical that if you sit there and start running external data buses and stuff like that, those specs may be very, very hard to hit. Okay. Questions on that? This is what you have to be careful of. Okay. Everyone, every one of the specs out there are, are like this, and they're becoming more complex like this, so you have to watch. Used to be in 10 bit A to D's, 8 bit A to D's. They had so much slop in them, it didn't matter. You just let them go. But now you're getting 12, 14 bits. Those clock noises are becoming significant. So I'm going to go quickly through some system considerations just to let you know what's going on. Um, some errors that sometimes are forgotten. Clock noises, IO port toggles, those are going to get into your A to D. Sensor accuracy and drift, you have to make sure that you've taken care of those. Input system effects. Specification may expect sleep mode, no IO toggling. ADC running into special clock mode. Check for them. Find out what the condition that that thing was specified for. So here's your quiz. VREF is there. R1 equals R2. 10 bit A to D. What's the reading out of the A to D? Depends on VREF, VCC, need to know resistor values, 512. That's the hardware guy. Half of VREF, five, well, 512, right? Half the resolution. This is ratio metric. It doesn't matter what the voltages are. I'm looking at the A to D reading. The A to D reading is going to be half of the A to D input. VREF divided by 2. Right? Ratio metric's nice because it doesn't matter what VREF is. It doesn't matter what plus 5 volts is. Ratio metric on the left, notice that the, the divider is fed by the, the VREF. On the right, they're totally independent. So this is a ratio metric reading. Right? VREF is powering up the ladder. Make sure you understand that. It's power supply pin. If you allow 3 millivolts of ripple onto VREF, you just lost an LSP. Okay. Is that ratio metric? Looks like it. RT's fed from VREF in the long run, right? VREF's fed from BCC. Yeah, if you have no noise between VREF and out here by the loads. No. And uh, that's not usually the case, right? The question always is, you know, I ask people when I do EMI presentations, what's ground? And I once saw a presentation, it was the best answer I ever saw. The guy said, ground is a good place to grow potatoes and carrots. <laughs> No such thing. V, the V plus rail is not the same everywhere. You want to make this thing ratio metric, put your sensors off the VREF. Bypass your input. Otherwise, you have noise going in, nothing's the same. Okay. The layout is critical. I even draw my schematics this way because of the fact that I want to make sure that when they lay it out, they realize it's not VCC going to the sensors, it's VREF. One thing I always want to look at, and actually we're running short of time, is when I talk about a half percent accuracy diode, what does that tell me? So if I needed 0.25% uh, accuracy, can I use a 0.5% accurate, percent accurate diode in that system? Maybe. If I calibrate, accuracy can be calibrated out. If I'm not going to calibrate, obviously it doesn't work. It depends on your drift and your temperature range. So the last thing I want to leave you with is all these specifications, if you can calibrate, you can get rid of a lot of things. But every component, every ADC has a drift and temperature spec. It cannot be calibrated out for the most part. So you must always consider that in addition. You go and you say, oh, I got this. 0.5% accurate diode. Great. What's its drift? Oh, 1,000 ppm per degree C. OK, so when temperature changes 10 degrees, you just lost 3% off your reference diode. 
it as, is as important, if not more, because once you got it, you can't do anything about it, I mean, reasonably. Right? So always check both the accuracy and the drift. And here you see that they actually give you a curve and show that the accuracy changes with temperature. Right. So we did look at the resolution. We looked at DC accuracy as far as offset, gain, and errors, how the A to D is tested. And we looked at now there's a whole new set of AC specs. And you have to consider those. There's some equations that will get you back and forth, but it's never exactly the same. So look at the manual. You know, from, from Renesis' side, I'm a proponent trying to get the specifications to go from a half a page to two pages so that people actually can use the A to D the way they think they wanted to use it. But in the meantime, a lot of times you're just going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to understand which spec means something to you and then use that spec. Okay. Questions? So I appreciate your feedback. I will be here all week running around a lot. You got any questions, want to talk a little bit about A to Ds? And thank you for your time.